In part one of this series, I showed you how to procedurally create a single shack with lots of variations and details. In part two, I showed you how to procedurally shade it so you have unique buildings for an infinite amount of variations. And in part three, I will actually showing you how to create these big stacks of buildings. I think this will be the most interesting one because it shows a lot of insights on how to place them, how to copy everything, instance it, create the details, the wiring. Um, so this will be a very feature packed session. I will do a step-by-step -step tutorial to show you the concept and the thought processes I went through. And then I will just go through the notes to explain what I did because it is a lot to cover and I don't want to do like a very long tutorial. I want to be short and sweet and obviously you will get the scene files if you sign up for my Patreon. And with the most recent Patreon update, it's a similar feature like Gumroad. I can actually put the scene files up for sale instead of a subscription model. So you can either do that or subscribe and you get full access to the scene files of this project. And obviously if you are a member, you will get access to all my previous scene files as well. All right, so now, very importantly, I had to be art directable. I wanted to recreate the plate essentially, right? So if I view this, this is my plate. I've got these stacks here. The color space is off, doesn't matter, but I've got these stacks and I wanted to really match the look of this. So the first idea was, how can I procedurally generate these stacks, but be still creative? And you can see, I kind of have a couple of things here and then I copy two points and a grid, and that is the main objective. So let me create a line. This is how I started out. A line, let's make this, I don't know, 50 units high, and maybe give this 10, grids at like 10 points on it which will be then my stories of the building i do a grid and i do a copy to points like that copy this over and now you can see i've got the grid copied over and maybe let's get rid of the subdivisions uh, to two and this is now a single stack obviously now it's just straight i want to shape it i want to have the bottom big and the top narrow and maybe some random shot buildings so i will use the adjust float node which is essentially not adjusting it's also creating data so by default it creates p scale which you want and you can see if i scale my constant value the grid gets bigger and i want to kind of shape it as i said from bottom to top so i will use bounding box make sure it's on y axis and you can already see now it's kind of tapering to the bottom i want to flip this so it's tapering to the top and then i can just adjust my min value let's say it's what 0.3 and I can make the base bigger and maybe the top bigger. And this is now my uniform tapering, which is great. And as I said as well, I want to kind of vary them. So I just do the same node again. And this time I'm setting the mode not to add, but to multiply. Right now we're multiplying by zero, which is not what we want. We want to kind of have a noise on it. So you can now see we've got the, this noise. And if you put both on one, nothing will happen because it will multiply by one. But now we can have a couple bigger and maybe a bit smaller. And then we can change the, the sizing of the noise pattern. It's very now art directable, which is pretty cool. Uh, we can change the offset so we can get kind of a random seed. And then let's say I'm fine with this, right? Now let me create a, another different line. So I'm just duplicating this, moving it over, merging them. If you Alt, if you select them and Alt, Click and drag the point, it creates a merge for you. And now you can see we do have um, another stack next, right next to it. We can change the, the, the tapering maybe, we can offset it or change the, the values on the other one. Let's say offset this. Um, I don't know, you can see it's, it's now, it's looking a little bit different now. And that, that is the idea. And the next step now is we want to kind of create an attribute on them so we can use a for loop because ideally I want to loop over every complete stack, stack one, stack two. And I also want to loop over every floor to create the buildings on it. So that's a two step process. How do we do it? We are working with lines. And if I create an enumerate node down below, this will allow me to create an index on a primitive. Right now we do have two primitives if I visualize the index, you can see we've got two colors, which is already perfect. Uh, instead of using um, index, let's just call the stack ID. If I visualize it again, now we've got stack ID. And 
it's a bit bizarre. I'm, there's probably a better way to do this, but what I will do now, I will do an attribute promote because I want to have it be on the points. If it's on the points, this will actually, maybe I can actually do it in here. Apply to points. I never tried. Let me just try this right on without me actually doing anything. Primitives, copy, and stack ID. Maybe it's not, not working as I thought it would. Maybe it's, it's too, yeah, it's not. Um, anyway, so I would use an attribute promote. Promote from primitive, the stack ID to points. So now the stack ID lives on each point. If I copy it over now, you can see we got now the data on the points, which is perfect. And now I just do another attribute promote to just, you know, reverse it back to the primitives. Again, there's probably a better way to do this. But, but anyways, now it lives on the primitives, which is what I want. And now I want to create a for each loop, which allows me, as I said before, to loop over each stack. Right now, it's looking for a name, but we renamed it to stack ID. So now you can already see if I just uh, show a single pass, we can now go over one, like it's looping over the stacks. Let's just rename this to uh, stack loop, probably end. And this is the stack loop start. And we want to create another one for each. As I said, we want to also loop over every floor. Hook that up. Oops, that is too many. That's too many. Like that. And we want to name this floor loop end and floor loop start. All right. That is awesome. So now we have the ability to also loop over every floor. If I go single pass, we can now go over every floor and the outer one is going over every stack. Let me just color them, something different. There we go. And now what do we want to do? We want to create these stacks on a single floor. The way to do this, I like the a scatter and align node. It's pretty new. I think 9 or 18.5 maybe introduced this or maybe 19, I'm not fully sure. Um, this allows me to do already orientations. It, it does a proper way of pushing the, the points outside so they do not intersect. And there's also a attribute from pieces. So these two kind of go hand in hand. Attribute from pieces expects some other input, which uh, we, we can provide. So before we continue here, let me pull in the stacks, like the individual buildings, which are these. And again, if you have the scene files of part two or if, you, or if you followed part two and part one, you will actually have exactly this setup where it is this for each loop and you get the HDAs and you will have kind of this to, to work off. Uh, you will notice that it already has name, 15 unique names. It has check ID, attributes, it's got points. It's got a couple of things set up ready. Um, if I hook this up now, it should not error out and each point now should get a unique name. You can see now we've got stack ID 3, 3, 10. They all have different kind of um, check IDs. And the check is a single building. That's the idea, which is great. So now we have a lot of points, which is probably way too many. So the scatter line allows me to adjust the coverage. We can reduce the amount. And we can also set a uniform scale. This kind of, you can see it gets, the bigger I make them, the less points people have because they are kind of pushing outside, which is cool. So if I have a uniform scale on two, I can also have a random size. So some are a little bit smaller, some are a little bit bigger. And we're still missing the, the shack. So if I do a copy to points, so essentially it's these three nodes, maybe I, I can color them. So these three nodes are what makes the instancing work. So make sure pack and instance is on and also make sure the piece attribute is set to name. And now let's hook up the same data. I think we need to have the points here on the right input and then the shacks on the left. And now you can see we have these unique copies. I can obviously use P scale now to make them smaller or go back to the scatter line and change the, the overall scale. But again, this will create more points. So we need to adjust the coverage. So we are not creating too many houses. And it's a, now it's a little bit tricky to know the, if the scale is correct. And what I always like to do just for testing sake, create a, uh, the test 
Tommy or some kind of um, test geometry. Max visualize this. So now we've got Tommy, make a transform node. And we do want to probably disable the packing so we actually get points so I can snap it quickly to somewhere. And if I hit X and point, I can actually snap it. If I zoom in here. I do want to have him in the corner. It's actually the size is good. He's probably a bit, it's like, it's probably a little bit too small, but I think that's good enough for what I want to show. So we can just leave with that, make sure pack is back on. And I would say our size is now good. Uh, you see they're all not oriented nicely. So in a scatter line, I have the option to rotate them. And this is now a random 360 angle. It works for if you want to scatter like foliage, that's probably it doesn't matter. But for like architectural things, I like to have a fixed kind of rotation angle. So I can, you can see if I put this to 45, the buildings will rotate only in 45 degree steps, which is perfect. I, you can obviously add random orientations if you feel like it, um, but that is mainly what I am setting up. And this is kind of what I have also in the big full up here on the right. Um, and now, if I visualize all the paths, like for one tower, this is now what it looks like. You already noticed that it feels like they are copied exactly at the same locations for every floor. And I don't want that. I want to have this varied for each floor. And here comes a cool trick, which it's a trick, but it's a very cool workflow. Um, these for each loops, they always have this little button, create meta import node. If I do that, I create a new node. Let me just rename this to meta, uh, just to make it a little bit shorter. And this node you will see has iteration, num iterations, value, and i value. I want to make use of this iteration. It is essentially the current number um, that we are iterating on. So this would be one, two, three, four. So I will make use of this as a seed attribute for my global seed on the scatter align. This will randomize the points for each floor. So how would we do this? It's actually, there's probably ways to make it like you can connect them, but I like it's for me, it's very easy to just do it via an expression. And how it works is we want to capture the detail attribute. And then we want to select a node. So it's dot dot forward slash, and then it's a uh, floor loop meta and just move down, put a, a, a quote, comma, the attribute you want to get is iteration. And then we just want to provide a default value. If it does not exist, I believe that's it. And now you can see we've got a three because this is the current index we are on. Look at this three, and now the value should be four, which is working great. One thing, because we have two loops, um, this number will probably be the same for every tower, for every stack. So we also want to make use of the iteration on the stacks, like each big tower. So I, I'm creating the same node like here and just do the same meta. And I will do the same logic on the same node and I just do a plus. So I'm copying the, the string plus and then I'm just selecting the other meta node. So this would be stack, stack loop start meta. And now it should still be four because we are on tower one as tower zero essentially. So, but the next tower, which it should be adding a one to the seed value. And that is the idea. So now we have a unique placement. So if I remove the single pass now, you can see that the placement now is unique per floor. And if I create a stacks two, they are also unique. So this is already pretty cool. And you can see there are some single buildings at the top. So maybe we could adjust the coverage maybe to seven, five, and then we get a little bit more buildings. And this is now up to you how you want to play with this. But all in all, this is the concept behind this, which generates these stacks. And it's highly art directable. I can move the lines, I can offset them, rotate them. And yeah, as I said, this is the, the tutorial of the step-by-step. -step. And now I will be ex going through um, the big note graph here on the right and explain all the things that are happening on top of this. All right, so this height profile is kind of the line which we had before uh, on here. It's just, it just has a little bit more logic to it. it. I'm creating this line 
manually. It's not a line node, it's a vex. It's just we've created vertex points and then appending them. And what this allows me is to specify exactly the floor height. So it's from one point to the next, it's exactly 4.5 units, which is 4.5 meters. And then I can just create the height. You can see now I'm just creating, okay, I want 15 floors or whatever. And this is what it allows me to do. And then I'm doing the same thing, P scale, doing random orientation. Um, I'm converting this to a line, doing floor height. Actually, I never use these. And then I'm using the same stack ID enumeration as I showed before, copy two points. And then the, I have all these stacks. These are now, if I go to camera view, I place them exactly where they are on my reference. That's how, why I meant I need to make sure it's art directable. And then it's exactly the same thing. And we, if I hop into the scatter line, you can see we've got very similar values. I'm doing a couple of cleanups here, attribute deletes. It's always good to have clean nodes. And then um, attribute from pieces. I have a weighting system here, which I technically don't need. It just allows me, I can specify one, one shack to be uh, more visible than others. And that's it. What, what you can see here, the split. So each um, shack, it's maybe hard to see in this instance, but each shack has lights and geo. If I visualize the lights, you can see these points live with, within each shack. There's li like little light points, which I use in the end for lighting them. And I'm just separating them, geo and points. And then I'm just grouping them and then again, merging them back in. So that's just what's happening here after the copy to points, nothing crazy. And this is now a single floor. So now what's going on here on the right, it's props, floor and beams. The props is um, a very similar process to what I did on the shacks itself. You can see I'm just generating very simple assets that have a unique name that I'm um, creating a scatter line node attribute from pieces, copying them over. And then you'll see that I have these five or six different props, which I'm just copying. Maybe I'll, way too many of these bigger water tanks, whatever. So technically what I could do, I could reduce the weighting of them. Which one? I'm not sure which one they are, these ones. So I can just reduce the weighting on them. Maybe also the other tanks a little bit less. And then we have them, yeah, not so frequent in the shot or whatever. You can see it's very flexible. Now the question is on what am I copying the points on? It's this, it's like a cutout. And how did I do that? Um, I'm bringing in the shacks. I am creating a connectivity node and then I'm creating a bounce around them with orientation on. So the, the boxes are oriented like the same way as the shacks. Then I'm creating, I have this, this setup, which I show in a second, which is essentially like walkways where the buildings are on. And then I'm just pulling out the shacks so I can place them so they will not intersect with each building. And then, yes, we're at the bottom. I create a props group and that's it. So next up is um, how did I create this? It's very simple. I'm creating my initial points. I'm randomizing them slightly. I'm doing like a connected JSON pieces, which will just connect each point to the next. Um, I'm deleting them by rest length, which you can create within the connected JSON pieces. Essentially what I'm doing, I'm just removing a certain length of values just to keep it simple. I'm doing a primitive split, so I have a unique primitive everywhere here. And then I'm scaling them bigger to create these, to just make them longer technically. And then I'm sweeping and then I get these nice overlaps. I'm creating a thick in which, which make, gives them some, obviously some thickness. Mops randomize, so if you want to use this Mops randomize node, um, the HDA, this allows me to randomly place them. So they're a little bit offset and then it's the same stack paths, create, it's a group and that's it. Beams is um, horizontal beams, just there for visual interest. Similar way, I'm starting with the bounds. I'm cutting up the, the top pieces, creating a shrink wrap around this, which essentially just is like a, a similar to bounds. It just creates a narrow pyramid around incoming geo. I'm moving them down, remeshing them, dividing them, just doing something interesting. And then I'm using labs random selection to create me 18 random points, which I'm naming start. And then a similar thing, naming them end. And then the find shortest path will look for these points, which we created up here or these groups, and it will find a shortest path and connect them. It's pretty cool. You can do lots of funky things with this node. And then I'm just fusing them and sweeping them to just give them a thickness and 
this I-beam structure. You might be wondering, how did I get this shape? Because the sweep doesn't provide that by default. You can see it has like a wrangle input. And here I had some fun with ChatGPT to help me actually write something that it looks like a lot, but it's a lot of repetitive code. Either way, it allows me to easily change the shape of these I-beams. And again, if you have the scene files, you will get the code or you can just copy this or write this out or whatever. And then it's just placing them. And then this is my horizontal beams. And all of this then goes together, looping over these both for loops. And then in the end, I have um, the, the tower stacks. You can see now, um, it's pretty much everything I just discussed in the basic example. It just looks a little bit more complex because we do have the props that we do have the horizontal beams. Yeah, it's just a little bit more interesting. So the next step, as you can see, we're going now to vertical beams. I like this approach quite a lot, actually. It's kind of like a ray intersection, and it looks where two points intersect that then it will create these vertical connections. So we are going into this stream, and you can see I'm just extracting the horizontal beams because these are the metal parts which I want to connect vertically as well. And then we are going similar as we did before, we are looping over every primitive, which is named stack ID. And then on these beams, I'm just scattering points. I'm setting a unique ID per point, which is based on PTNum. And I'm doing two copies, two streams of data. One is raying and I'm creating a ray hit group. You can see there's a little bit of a jump where they move down. And then the other one is not transforming. It's just staying where it is and it's also creating this ray hit group. And then I'm just deleting everything which has no connection, which haven't been intersecting, and I'm merging them together. And because they have the same ID, which we created above here, I can use this add node to connect poly or create polygons by attribute, which is then ID. And you can see we have um, these vertical beams. I'm deleting the very small ones, so they go away, doing some orientation up and normals and up vector using the same I beam node before and then doing the sweep. And now we do have these vertical beams. And if I look all at all of them like that, these are now all the vertical beams were created. And if I view the results with them connected, it now makes a lot more sense because they are actually going vertically down until they hit a building or a floor. And then you can see it does not go through this building, it stops wherever it intersects. Uh, where is it going? I lost it. There we go. So this beam just stops on the roof of this building. It does not penetrate, which is pretty nice. And then it starts on this horizontal beam, goes down until it hits something. And that way we are creating these nice overhanging beams, which I think make a lot of visual interest. You can see them here in my reference. We get these super long vertical beams. I like that look. It's maybe a bit exaggerated, but it does work. And next up, we have wires and connecting wires. It's essentially creating points similar to we did on the vertical beams. If I jump into the scatter node, you can see it's scattering on the vertical beams. You can see I'm selecting this group. And we're also scattering on everything else as well. So we've got lots of points. I'm merging them. I'm creating a random sort order. Um, it gives just a little bit better results. And then I'm using connect adjacent pieces to create this network of wires, doing a primitive split to um, separate them, deleting the very small ones, doing another random selection, but this time I'm deleting randomly points. And then I'm just cleaning it up to get rid of all the unwanted attributes and merging it back in here. On the right hand, I'm doing a very similar thing. I'm just creating the longest connections it can find. So I have a max distance slot and min and max length. Again, this code, you can dissect it. It's essentially looking for points with a certain distance from each other, and it finds these connections. I'm doing the same thing, cleaning it up and then merging them. So I've got these two different setups, I'm creating a enumerator credit unique cable ID. And then again, using the labs cable generator to create the wires hanging. And they've got a pseudo gravity, which means it's not simulated. It's just kind of a um, parabola, technically, between two points. And it creates a really cool result. They are a little bit 
yeah, not connected all the time. But from what the distance I'm actually rendering this, it's, it's very, very good. Deleting attributes to clean it up, packing it. And then at the end, hero wires cached out to disk. You can see we've got plenty of wires. If I look at the main, um, this is what, what it looks like. And if I look at my end result, uh, you can now see we have these connecting wires from the horizontal beams, from the vertical beams. They kind of connect to the buildings going down the floor. So it's kind of working very nicely. Um, the right hand, the connecting wires, is essentially the same setup. But instead of going from house to house or shack to shack, it's connecting these bigger stack towers. So the, these individual stacks have connections as well. So that's what it, this is about. The light section... Um, it's also quite interesting. I'm bringing in the lights from each tower, doing a little bit of an offset so they're all not on the same plane. You can see a little bit of a point jitter. And I'm also creating, uh, bringing the wires and scattering points on the wires. So we actually have lights hanging down from these connecting wires. And then I'm just jittering them up a little bit. Um, bringing them together. So I've got all these points and I'm creating a color on them based on this range. Um, it's based with a noise. Then I'm creating another one. I'm just um, adding them for a very subtle, like a very small amount. I'm just increasing and adding white to them. So we have a couple of white colors as well for the lights. And then I'm creating a unique ID from all the lights. I just wanted to create a random selection of rooms, essentially. I, I didn't want to color individual lights because... Normally, if you look outside and you see high rises, there's mainly rooms which have a different color to them. It's not individual lights itself. So that's why I wanted to, to use this group expression to find different random groups of houses which, which have a unique color. And then I was able to make them whatever color as well. So this is now a blue purple color. And then I'm caching them. And these are my light sources. In the end, we have 3,200 lights that will be used to illuminate all these stacks. And if I go to the bottom here, out, out is just showing then my final output, which will be going into Solaris to actually render finally. And this concludes part three. Part four will be all about lobs, all about instancing, bringing in the shacks, prototypes, adding fire to the barrels, which is hardly visible, Doing all the material assignments, everything will happen in Solaris for part four. And I hope you are excited to just see part four. I think it will be great. Thanks for watching part three and I will see you in the next one.